here. Of course, it's still a little bit before noon here in uh, the West Coast. It's about 11.40 right now. want to thank everybody who's joining in on this live stream. we got 16 people who are already here with 12 likes. I love seeing those likes buttons get hit as soon as you come into the live stream. The algorithm will pick up the video, spread it around for more people to join in. We're going to talk about the lowering of interest rates not having any kind of real impact on the economy as far as being stimulative. Right now, a lot of people look at the Federal Reserve achieving their goal of 2% and thinking that the lowering of interest rate is somehow a good thing for the economy. But in all reality, the lowering of interest rates is a sign that there is bad economic times taking place and that the Federal Reserve is trying to become more accommodating to the economy by lowering interest rates, making it easier for people to borrow money to go buy houses, cars and go on vacation. <clears throat> This is kind of the typical belief coming from most people who are following the economy. Now, when you really think about what is taking place right now, it is very interesting to see how much reaction is happening within the economy right now. You think about some of the interest rates, where they're headed, how gold is reaching its all-time high. The dollar is moving up alongside of gold moving up as well. These are things that are very confusing for a lot of people out there when you think about what it is that the Federal Reserve is attempting to do. Because because most people that I have found believe that the Federal Reserve is political and that they are going to adjust interest rates due to it being an election year. That is a really far off concept for me to try and understand considering how much diving into research I've done to try and understand the monetary policy from the Federal Reserve stance. And now what the Federal Reserve is really doing right now is they're using the idea of cutting interest rates. See, the Federal Reserve, even if they were to lower interest rates today, this is something that a lot of people really have to consider. If they dropped interest rates today, the real impact from that dropping of interest rates doesn't really hit the economy for anywhere from six months to a year, even 18 months down the road before the full impact of that cutting of rates has that you know full effect on the economy. Now, there are people who will begin to use those lower interest rates but to have a significant impact, it takes time for those interest rates to work into the economy. However, the idea impacts the markets right away. And you can see all the reactions that are happening right now. People are talking about like how gold is reaching this whole time high, how the interest rates on mortgages, you know, are well, in a lot of ways, they've come down from the from their peaks, but they're not coming down in a significant fashion. When you would think that the Federal Reserve is cutting rates, you would think that they would come down as well. And this is what a lot of people perceive. I mean, even if you go back to the beginning of the year or just towards the end of the year and the Federal Reserve put out that forward guidance, forward guidance, it wasn't forward guidance at all. There was the dot plot map. But everybody was convinced that there was going to be seven, eight, nine cuts this year in 2024. And they started behaving as if that was happening. And we found that it even impacted the housing market. And that was the excuse that they used to say that, hey, housing market had somewhat of a, not a rebound, but a turnaround, right? As far as more people taking out mortgages and more people buying houses or signing deals on houses. Well, to me, that was the idea that the Federal Reserve was going to be cutting rates into the future and that you could refinance your home into those cheaper rates. So that sparked people's, you know, idea that, hey, I can go ahead and buy a house now with the idea that I'll be able to refinance it into the future. But that's not the truth of the matter. Right. There is no guarantee that there's going to be a dropping of interest rates. There is no guarantee of from the dot plot map. There's no guarantee coming from Jerome Powell. There's no guarantee of rate cuts. In fact, they are constantly saying that they are data dependent, meaning that they don't really know what they're going to be doing with interest rates until they actually get to the point in which that it's time to vote on whether or not they should be cutting rates. So there is no forward guidance taking place right now. But the belief itself just the idea, the capabilities, that drives the markets. And every time that there is this narrative that pushes out there that says, hey, we're going to be cutting rates in June or we're going to be doing three rate cuts or whatever, any time you hear this coming out into the news, that starts creating market reactions. And those market reactions are real. They definitely take place. But the Federal Reserve for months now has done nothing. They've sat on their hands same policy that they have conducted themselves in, but yet the market believes that there is so much different things taking place within the within the Federal Reserve and their monetary policy 
that they actually begin to react as if those things have already been implemented. There's nothing that has changed. So again, it's the credible threat that is really that is the is the monetary policy coming from the Fed, not the adjustment of rates, because the adjustment of rates will not impact the economy in a way that a lot of people think like they assume that by dropping the interest rates like we're at five, five and a half percent on the Fed funds rate. The idea is, is that if they were to drop interest rates, say, even, you know, three quarters of a percentage point, do three rate drops this year. People have an impression the lowering of interest rates is stimulating. That is incorrect. That is not a correct statement. The lowering of interest rates makes it less restrictive because what we have is a neutral interest rate that nobody knows exactly where it's at. But the neutral interest rate is the rate when Fed is neither accommodating nor restricting the economy and they are above the neutral interest rate. If future inflation expectation remains elevated, the neutral interest rate will begin to rise, making the economy less restricted by the Fed funds rate position. Right. So if the Fed stays, stays still, doesn't move and the neutral interest rate begins to rise, it makes that Fed funds rate less restrictive on the economy as the neutral interest rate moves ever closer to the Fed funds rate. However, it has not moved significantly. And since nobody knows exactly where it's at, we have to go off of the idea that it was somewhere between one or zero to one and a half percent by a lot of like economists at the Federal Reserve, like John Williams, the New York Fed president. That's where he said the neutral interest rate probably is somewhere between zero and one and a half percent. Other economists out there said it was somewhere around two percent. There's even people who say it's at three to three and a half percent. Even if it's at three and a half percent, the lowering of interest rates by three quarters of a percentage point would still be above the neutral interest rate. It would still be restrictive. We are going to be in a restrictive economy going into the future. That is not a stimulating effect by lowering interest rates. It's not enough, right? In order for the Federal Reserve to have a monetary policy that was going to be accommodating by the lowering of interest rates, they would literally have to drop it down to zero. So anything as far as a Fed funds rate that is above zero is most likely not going to be stimulating the economy, not the adjustment of interest rates. Their words, the belief, the market's reaction, that will stimulate the economy. And if people believe that the Federal Reserve is going to be lowering interest rates into the future, they will behave as if that had already happened, which would be the same impacts as if they had lowered rates, but they don't have to do anything. They just have to make sure that the people believe that the Federal Reserve is going to be lowering interest rates because that is the real monetary policy coming from the Fed, not the actual adjustment of rates, because that doesn't really do much anymore. But their job owning, their words, that has a serious impact on the economy. And that's where the Federal Reserve is trying to maintain their monetary policy is within their statements as opposed to their actions. Right? And this is like, I know this is a very hard thing to really wrap your head around the, to, to try and bring this concept into, you know, into, to internalize this concept and to really be able to understand what it is that you need to do with your life, with your, you know, financial decisions, your business, you know, whether or not you buy the house or the car, this is very difficult things to follow, especially when you have so many people out there trying to explain the monetary policy, saying that the federal reserve is going for like this 2% goal. That is is so prevalent within the mainstream media, within the narratives out there, but it is simply just does not exist at the Fed. Like the 2% goal does not exist at the Federal Reserve's strategy, their monetary policy, any of it. They are going for a 2% average inflation rate over time, which means at times their target will be above 2%, like right now. They are not targeting 2%. They are targeting above 2% to achieve a 2% average inflation rate over time. And this monetary policy that they are conducting right now will not be reviewed until the end of this year. So we know that they're still moving towards a 2% average inflation rate over time. Very strange, right? Okay, so point of that, right? It's their words that are conducting monetary policy, not their actions. And their words are totally being absorbed by the mainstream media, by the markets, and they are reacting as if the Federal Reserve has actually done something. They have done nothing at all except for sit on their hands and, you know, watch it all take place. All right. Moving to some of the questions here. 
All right. Um, have fun, guys. I'll be picking up my boat. Hey, right on. Good for you. Brody says, thank you, Simon. Thank you, Brody. Hit the like button on the way in, everyone. Yes, please do. Owen says, anyone else listen to Jerome Powell's speech? Question the answer at Stanford University. Has some interesting things to say. I haven't. I've been at work all day, so I'm going to go and listen to hopefully catch some of that. All right. Morning gang, says Big Hill. Dishes has smiley face. Uh, Brody says, hi, Dishes. Big Hill, morning gang. Oh, you already read that one. Okay. All nighter, hider. I am here. Like has been hit. We can start now. Right on. Hey, Buck, Bodie, Own Dishes, and Big Hill. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Hello from Southern Manitoba. That was Paul. Brady, Owen, I have listened to it yet. I haven't listened to it yet. What are your takeaways? Isaac says, let's go. Rich, yo, you, E, what a B, buddy. What's happening, man? All right, Brody says, all nighter. Y'all just talking to each other. All right, self-education liked and here. All right, Long Beach Joe says, facts. Self-education, hail nighter. Salutes and respects to the uneducated in the chat. Yes, thank you, Long Beach Joe Jets, man. Daniel, he's back. All right, all nighter. And that voice tells me to drop my tools and go eat lunch while consuming great content. Right on, guys. There is no lowering of rates. Calling 10 on the die. Afternoon. Good afternoon, Kevin from Lakeland, Florida. All right, Brady, Fed rate does not set mortgage rates to begin with. You're right. It doesn't. It, it doesn't. It, it influences, right? So the Federal Reserve and their Fed funds rate is really the overnight lending rate. Well, what was essentially at one time, the overnight lending rate between the big banks. So the, the rate that these big banks lend to each other, that's like where the Fed funds rate is established. After that, all the rest of the interest rates are then influenced by that overnight lending rate coming from the Federal Reserve. Now, again, that isn't necessarily the overnight lending rate like once we had experienced prior to the pandemic, because the Fed funds rate or the effective funds rate had moved from the overnight lending rate at these big banks over to the repo facility and the interest on excess reserves. But still, really, it's that rate right there that then influences the rest of the market. So if the bank can loan money to the Federal Reserve, or to the U.S. government at a particular rate, everything else is going to become more expensive out there after that, or the interest rates are going to be higher because you're taking on more risk, right? So like the U.S. Treasury would be the safest asset. If a bank can lend money to the government and get a guaranteed return, you know that everything else after that is going to be risky and have to have a higher interest rate in order to you know, compensate for the risk. So if the Fed funds rate moves up, then all interest rates begin to move after that. Now, again, mortgage rates are a little different in the sense that there is also a pool of buyers and a pool of, you know, investors and stuff like that. So they do operate independently from the Federal Reserve. And you can actually see that taking place when the Federal Reserve went into their raising of interest rates. They were moving them up and the mortgage rates had shot up almost instantaneously, not really working in lockstep with the Fed. Right. So as the Fed were kind of incrementally moving interest rates up, the mortgage rates shot up to like eight percent or so practically overnight, like within a matter of a few weeks. And they just plateaued out that. Right. They just stayed there. Well, that was the market pricing in the Fed getting out. Right. So once the market had priced in the Fed getting out, the sun shield up here, then that's where the mortgages ended up finding their their equilibrium. And so if the Federal Reserve was to do something like, say, end the unwinding of mortgage-backed securities or even made an announcement that they might be moving back in to the purchases of mortgage-backed securities, you would see the markets instantly. They wouldn't have to do anything. Just make that statement and you would start seeing the interest rates adjusting. In fact, I would imagine that you would see rates dropping dramatically as the investors would feel confident that they could buy into the mortgage-backed security market knowing that they would have an outlet, the Federal Reserve, who is, you know, would make the same. Not that they have done this, but I'm saying if they did. Right? So anyway, moving on. All right. Fed rate. Okay. Uh, do -do. Zero or one cut in 2024. Credible threat, anyone? Absolutely. Lowering rates generally signals a crash. It means that they have broken the economy so badly that they cannot cycle enough equity for the Fed to buy more long-term bonds and assets. To me, like, 
Ultimately, when I see all the quantitative easing taking place, to me, that is to try and bring belief to the world that there is enough liquidity to cover all the debts that have been issued out there in dollars. Like, there's no way that the Fed, like, if all the debts that were due in dollars came due right away, I don't think the Federal Reserve could even print at a pace that is fast enough to even cover all those debts. Like, at all. Like, I don't think the Federal Reserve could do it. First of all, there wouldn't be enough assets out there for them to even purchase. Like, you know, unless the government went into some, like, intense, intense deficit spending. Like, serious deficit spending. Then I don't know what it is that the Federal Reserve would really purchase out there to provide enough dollars and liquidity for the market to cover all the debts that have that have been written in dollars. Ultimately, I would think that the Federal Reserve, if they came into a situation like that where the liquidity crunch around the world was so intense that the quantitative easing coming out of the Federal Reserve would have to ramp up way more than it ever experienced, what would they buy? They would have to buy the debt of foreign countries. Like literally go to a foreign nation, buy their version of a treasury, their sovereign bonds, put it on the balance sheet and issue out U.S. dollars for those purchases. And then in that sense, they might have more assets that they could buy in order to provide the liquidity to the world. But ultimately, they just can't do it. Like they, the, the government can't go into that much deficit spending and the Federal Reserve really doesn't have that much that they can purchase without moving into like the foreign debt of, of another nation. Like what is it they're gonna purchase? Like more mortgages, more US treasuries? I mean, what are they gonna start moving into the, into like corporate stocks or something like that? I, I mean, that's illegal, they can't really do that. But you see where I'm kind of getting at? It's just like there's not enough money, liquidity out there to cover all the debts of the world. Uh, uh, one thing Powell mentioned was politics, elections don't play into what they do. Doesn't matter the political leadership. That's right. Besides that stuff that UE has been saying for a while. Yeah. I mean, here's the thing. Like, if you don't understand monetary policy from any other position, like, I don't understand it from a Republican position, a Democratic position. I don't understand it from any kind of like other position out there other than what the Federal Reserve has been saying because that's the only people that I've been listening to when it comes to monetary policy. Fiscal policy might be something totally different, like politics totally play a role into that. But the actual monetary policy, it is it is kind of confusing in a lot of ways, but if you basically sit in the room long enough with them, you start picking it up, you start understanding it. And that's where I really was reading the Federal Reserve speeches, you know, going back into speeches that were given 20 years ago. Uh, really, once you start putting it together and you listen to it for a while, it really starts to make a lot of sense what it is that they're trying to move towards. Now, it's not like making sense in the way that it was just like, hey, this is gonna be a benefit for everybody out there. It, it, not like that, like that, that part doesn't make sense at all. But it does make sense when you think about it from the position that they have a monetary policy that they are trying to conduct, tr trying to, to conduct, and it was becoming ineffective. Like the Federal Reserve would typically have a pretty easy job to do, right? It's not easy, but it's a pretty easy job, right? You provide the liquidity and an interest rate. That's it, right? So you set the interest rates and you determine the level of liquidity, the amount of money that you have out there in the system. That's the two things that the Federal Reserve does. Right? And so if you come to a position in which that you can no longer lower interest rates, like you hit the lower bound of zero, that's your monetary policy. You're done, you're, you're out of the game, right? I mean, typically you would wanna keep, keep your, your ammo available for you know, downturns in the economy, and that would be the lowering of, inter of interest rates. But if you're at zero, you have nothing. There's, there's nothing left there. You can't adjust interest rates no more. So stimulating the economy is going to be very difficult if you can't drop interest rates any further, right? So now the major problem with the Federal Reserve and the lowering of interest rates was hitting that lower bound to zero. And the reason why they were at zero is because the neutral interest rate had gone down so far. The neutral interest rate was low because of the future expectations of inflation were low, right? So you think about it, just the people themselves, right? Regardless of anything else out there going on with politics and war and all the environment and all that other stuff, in 2000, 
eight, right? The great financial crisis started to take place. There was going to be some major deflationary uh, problems hitting the economy, right? And we were facing it. I mean, you saw the housing market crashing, the stock market crashing, all this stuff was going down. That was a deflationary event that was about ready to just wipe out the entire United States and the entire world, really. But the quantitative easing fired up. Quantitative easing, one, two, three, and four, took the Fed's balance sheet from $850 billion, $850 billion to over four and a half trillion. It was a quadrupling, a better than a quadrupling of the balance sheet and the money supply, right? This was crazy to think about. This put in an impression into the people that there was going to be a hyperinflation scenario. I know I was one of them, right? I mean, I started diving into silver because I was sure of it. All this money, print, all this money printing was going to absolutely destroy the dollar. In fact, if you had asked me back then, how long does the dollar have? I said it would have been gone by now, right? I would have had full faith belief that that was going to be the case, that the dollar was going to absolutely fail during that time. Guess what? There was almost no inflation, almost none. There was a little bit in at times, right? The Federal Reserve had a 2% target that they were trying to maintain. And that 2% target was failed to be achieved. Most of the time, the inflation ran under that 2%. So even with all the quantitative easing, the quadrupling of the, of the money supply, all that stuff failed to get the inflation scenario up to the 2% target or even rise above it any kind of significant manner. Here's the problem. The Federal Reserve had an inflation expectation, not the Fed, the people, right? Their inflation expectation was persistently too low. That screwed the Federal Reserve out of being able to conduct themselves with their typical monetary policy. This is, this is really important to understand. This is like probably the most important part of the Federal Reserve and their monetary policy is to understand that they were done, out, out of the game, right? but they knew that this moment was coming and that inflation expectation persistently too low was going to be an issue that they had to have solved they had to fix that problem they needed an inflation expectation that was persistently too high rather than too low if they had an inflation expectation that is too high they could start moving their fed funds rate up to combat that inflation expectation and they could get their ammo back this is what the Federal Reserve absolutely needed to do, and they were talking about this back in 2018, prior to the pandemic, prior to any inflationary scenario. In fact, at the time, they were talking about having an average inflation rate, and I was questioning it then. I was like, how are you gonna have an average inflation rate if you can't even get inflation to 2%, okay? But now here we are. Federal Reserve has totally got their ammo back. They use their words for monetary policy, the inflation expectation is now elevated and remaining elevated, well anchored, right where they want it. Right? This is all part of the Fed's plan and understanding it from this position is a much better way to be because now you can make you know decisions for your business, whether or not you're gonna buy that house, that car, and you're not reliant on whether or not the right politician gets voted into place because it doesn't really matter who's in office. This monetary policy goes back 20 years, 30 years. If you follow it enough, you can really see where they were planning this stuff out back in early 2002 with Ben Bernanke's speech talking about deflation and with the all the tools that they would need in order to combat inflation are the things that they are using right now. This is what they're using to combat deflation to create the inflationary scenario that they absolutely need in order for them to conduct their monetary policy. All right. So I'm going to cruise past a bunch of these comments. We got so many of them up in there. Okay. If I can't take my silver and gold everywhere, I don't want it. Um, I don't know. I think, Ricky, I don't know what you guys are talking about there, but you always want silver and gold in possession. I mean, think about it. Gold right now is at $2,300 an ounce. Holy crap. I mean, I remember when it crossed over a thousand dollars an ounce and I thought that that was pretty incredible but now here we are at twenty three hundred dollars an ounce talk about a safe a safe place to be out there outside of that third party claim you don't have to worry about the market you know stock market you don't have to worry about you know political environments you don't have to worry about any of that stuff you know it's a risk risk free from the third party and that is probably one of the coolest things about mon about owning precious metals or having precious metals in your possession especially when they're reaching all-time highs it just makes you feel better about the situation all right 
Uh, anyone getting better than 5% ROI, ROI on their money at the moment? Why is it that expectations being too low would screw them? Was it just the expectations or the actual rate being low? Okay, that, that, that's, very, uh, that's a very good question. Let me see if I have it here for you. Okay, monetary policies for a low neutral interest rate world. Go read this speech. It was given November 30th, 2018. Okay? Now, it says, it says in here, um, so the inflation expectations, let me see if... Uh, Because he does talk about how the inflation expectation, let me see if I can find, I don't want to read this whole thing to you, but I just, okay. Here we go. A number of alternative policy frameworks have been proposed to aim to tackle problems associated with a lower bound of interest rates. Although they differ in many ways, it is useful to divide these problems or these pr proposals into three broad categories. The first option is to maintain the basic framework of inflation targeting and rely on a combination of aggressive, unconventional, or conventional and unconventional policy actions when facing economic downturns to limit the de deleterious effects of the lower bound. This carries with it the risk of inflation expectations becoming anchored at too low a level. All right, so that's not the part that I was really looking for, but. Ultimately, if you have an inflation expectation that is too low, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. So if you have inflation expectation that is low, most likely you're going to end up with inflation that is low. If inflation expectation is elevated, then you are going to be making decisions, going to do investments, going to do savings, whatever it is that actually creates the inflation scenario out there. I know this is really hard for a lot of people to, to kind of wrap their head around, but if you actually have an idea that inflation is going to be ramping up into the future, then most likely you are going to start doing things today that will then combat that particular outcome. You're going to buy your products today faster, earlier, quicker, right? Then you would if it was, if you were to wait. So basically, if you feel that inflation is going to be coming, then you might want to buy that $100 item before it goes to 110. You see where I'm kind of getting at? By buying the item now, what you are doing is creating a situation that what a lot of people would be doing is they're buying that item now, right? So this starts creating the consumerism that starts driving the prices up. Now, it would work exactly the opposite way in a deflationary scenario. If you felt that, you know, you could either buy it right now for a hundred dollars but if you wait just a little bit you might be able to get it for ninety dollars then you're gonna back off on your purchases right? same thing this expectation that is coming into the future would then back you away from making those purchases which would then in turn slow the consumering down right? so inflation expectation that is persistently too high is the position in which that the Federal Reserve can now deal with because if it was too low they can't combat it Right? They can't combat the, the inflation that is persistently too low. They can combat an inflation that is persistently too high. And I know this, it's, and really the problem really wouldn't exist at all if it wasn't for the fact of the lower bound of zero. Right? Because if they were up at like 15% on the Fed funds rate, there's all kinds of places to move. They can move the Fed funds rate down 5%, give total room for stimulating the economy. But dropping the interest rates down to zero right now would give very little stimulative like impact to the economy because they wouldn't be able to get that far below the neutral interest rate. They would want to drop significantly below that. Keeping the inflation expectation elevated then gives them the ability to raise these interest rates to combat inflation, right, which gives them their ammo back. This is the position that they would rather be in than that the lower bound of zero where they have no impact from their monetary policy, but only have the impact of perception of the people out there with massive quantitative easings and, you know, the narrative that there's, you know, the end of the world is coming and stuff like that. So. Uh, you don't realize the lack of utility. The first thing you're talking about is what it's worth. Um, let's see here. All night of precious metals being gold, silver, brass, and lead. Absolutely. All right. Gold should be worth over $10,000 an ounce as the hedge against inflation. And we are five times more poor today than ever before. So gold should be five times as high. Hmm. 
Benny, all right, Benny, what up, man? Simon, any plans for the solar eclipse on the 4-8 with the family or alone by yourself? Taking in the sights, speeding on Leif Erikson. <laughs> no, we had a nice solar eclipse here a couple of years ago, so that was pretty decent. But no, I don't plan on doing anything with the solar eclipse. All right, 30% higher. That's the be stocks. Okay, um... Stocks are a scam for individual investors. All right, but instead of gold and real estate is manipulated. All right, I invest in real estate, safest asset I know of. Benny, back to Benny. As long as there is debt free being issued in dollars, or as long as there's debt being issued in dollars, things won't be a changing. Hate to burst any bubbles. Yeah, and I kind of agree a lot with that, Benny. I think people like. The whole idea of the BRICS nations coming in and replacing the dollar is such, such a far off concept. I mean, to really understand like how that would take place, you really have to understand Gresham's Law, Trippin's Dilemma, have to understand how it is that the the dollar even became the world reserve. And to get knocked off of that pedestal is not going to be something that is like going to be easily done right in fact it would probably have to take some serious devastating depressionary type of environment in order to bring in a currency that would then be able to have the confidence of the people and also have a position in which that a country could actually issue it out and and the main reason is is that there's there's two like if you really want to know this the information really well, I just did a members only video a couple of days ago. Literally, it's a dollar a month to join the membership of this channel, this the YouTube channel membership. It's a dollar a month and you have access to an insane amount of videos and live streams that I have done. Not an insane amount, but a bunch of them anyway, that really break a lot of this stuff down. And we just covered one just recently talking about how it is that the dollar became that world reserve currency. And to really understand it, you, you have to know that there's a couple of things that the United States is doing that no other nation can even come remotely close to doing. And one of them is, is that deficit spending, deficit trade. Right, that's really it. The deficit trade. We import a hell of a lot more than we export. And now by doing that, we import stuff and we export dollars. That's how the dollars really get out to the world. We can either give it to them, they can, you know, we can invest in other nations, or we can buy their stuff. Right? I mean, that's really how we get the dollars out there. And so as the world reserve currency, the demand for dollars is huge because a lot of people have written debts that are due in dollars, right? So if they're written in dollars, they're due in dollars, they need dollars in order to pay those debts. And those people are not, don't have anything to do with us. They don't have anything to do with the United States, not our governments, not our corporations, not our banking system, nothing. They have nothing to do with us, but yet they have used the dollar as the facilitator of the trade, right? So now there's a position in which that the Federal Reserve needs to not only conduct a monetary policy for the United States, but then also provide these dollars to the rest of the world. How does that take place, right? Well, the Federal Reserve, one, needs something to buy, right? They need an asset to buy. They can buy mortgage-backed securities. They can buy U.S. Treasuries. They can buy gold. They can buy SDRs. They can buy the debt of another foreign nation, right? But ultimately, they buy U.S. Treasuries. U.S. Treasuries. Now, how do they get the U.S. Treasuries? They got to get it from the government. How does the government produce treasuries? By going into debt. So there's no other nation out there that is going to be willing to go into as deep a debt like the United States has in order to provide the safe and liquid asset, those U.S. Treasuries, right? If there was another nation out there willing to do that, then, you know, well, then we can consider them as a possibility of being a world reserve currency. But no nation even comes close. In fact, no nation wants to do that. All nations would, don't want to be the debt issuer. They want to be the producer, the manufacturer, selling products, then bringing in cash, right? That's the way they, that most nations want to work. You become a strong economy by working and saving, right? That's producing and saving. And so if you are a nation that wants to have a world reserve currency, you can't be producing a bunch of stuff and selling it to the world. The world will be sending you money. You're trying to get the money out there to the world. That means you have to buy their stuff. So now you're going to go into deficit spending, right? Trade deficits in order to provide the world with this liquidity. And you're going to be doing a bunch of deficit spending in order to create the asset for the Federal Reserve to buy to provide the liquidity for the world. 
This is a very, it's kind of complicated, but it's also a very prestigious and unique position to be in that nobody else can really touch, right? Like, I mean, is there another name, China? You're gonna trust the debt of China? Like, you're gonna buy up a bunch of, you know, Yuan Chinese-based debt, put that on your balance sheet and say, yeah, man, this is a safe and liquid asset? Hell no, of course not. Nobody's gonna trust China in that way. Nobody trusts any of these nations in that fashion. Like, they trust the United States because it's time proven, right? That there's, and there's really nothing else out there that can do it. It's just, just the United States, so they stand alone. And now, if even if you were to go to gold, let's say that they did move to a gold, gold currency or something of that nature, then the most industrious of those nations, the ones who sold the most products to the most people, would then hoard all the gold and deprive everybody else of being able to do, you know, have the liquidity to do transactions. And this was the suffering that most nations were going through, and that's the reason why the United States was issuing out all these dollars. It was just like, hey, you need liquidity to do your transactions. We have these dollars. They're just about as good as gold. Right, so why don't you just use these dollars instead of gold? Oops, sorry, we printed way too many dollars. We're not gonna exchange all those dollars for gold. But now that it's already being used, what else is there? Nothing, right? So this is really how the Federal Reserve ended up in that position. Anyway, we did a, a live, not a live stream, but I did a video on that for a members only, and you should really go check it out. It's a really good one. All right, good money versus bad money. Isn't that Gresham's law? That's right. And so, again, deja vu just nailed it right there. If you have two currencies in play, right, you have a good currency and a bad currency. Now, let's use gold, for example. Like, gold is a pretty good currency. Dollars, not so good. But now you have these two in your hand. And I'm a merchant. You're going to come buy something from me, right? You're going to buy this bottle of water off of me. And now you come to me and you're like, hey, man, how much for the bottle of water? I'd be like, hey, man, it's $15, right? And you're like, well, I got $15 in cash or I got this, you know, little tiny, itty bitty tiny piece of gold that I'll, that's worth $15. Which one will you accept? And I say, hey, I'll take either one of those. I'll take the cash or I'll take that little tiny piece of gold that's worth $15, either one of them. So now tell me, are you really going to sit there and go like, well, here, you can have my gold? Or are you going to be like, here, you can have the cash and I'm going to hold on to the gold coin? Right? You're probably going to hold on to the gold coin and get rid of the cash. In fact, I've asked 100 people this exact question. Everybody said cash. Nobody's told me that they would give me the gold coin. Everybody said that they would hold the gold. So the gold is the good currency, right? Cash is the bad currency but the cash is the one that's being used. It chased the good currency out because now the gold is getting hoarded away. So bad currency chases out good. Now let's introduce a good currency into the system. What's gonna happen? Nothing, because the good currency is gonna get hoarded onto. Well, let's introduce a bad currency. Well, like you're really gonna use that. Like you're gonna bring in a bad currency that's worse than the dollar and say, yeah, let's use that instead. Why don't we use in pesos? Why don't we use in rubles? Why don't we use in, you know, actually I shouldn't use pesos. Mexican pesos are actually doing pretty strong. But you know what I'm kind of getting at here, right? There's no other currency out there that's going to compete against the dollar, whether it's a good currency or bad currency. Right? Gresham's law prevents that. Now, there is something called Thier's law, which is the exact opposite of Gresham's law when good money does chase out the bad money. But the bad money has to completely collapse. It has to be so worthless that nobody will be willing to accept it. Then the good currency can come in. Right now, the dollar is still accepted. It's like, I mean, it might be on its way out. There might be a lot of people who, you know, are feeling that way. But ultimately, there is no other currency out there that has as much demand to cover the debts as the dollar does, right? There's just simply not. So you can't, right? Gresham's Law, Tristan's Dilemma, they prevent that from happening. All right. Uh... I got two geese flying over my head. Can you hear them? <laughs> All right. Um, okay guys, I'm going to give it one more question and then I have got to go back to work. We are 40 minutes into this. It was a great live stream. We have 224 people watching with 81 likes. Thank you so much for hitting that like button. Uh, please go hit that thing before you exit out of the, uh, the live stream or before we end it. The YouTube algorithm will love it and bring in more, uh, more people to watch it. Farts are great for laughs too. Laughter is healthy, so I choose healthy care farts over fiat. 
<laughs> okay. Uh, why aren't we using BTC? Same reason, Brady. The same reason as we're not using gold is that there's just simply not enough out there to provide for all the world's transactions. Now, it's a deflationary currency, meaning that the more that people use it or choose to use it or start net, you know, if the networking effect of it grows, then there's less ability to do transactions with that currency while maintaining that price. You can drop pricing, right, and be able to then use it to do transactions. But if you were to maintain that same price, there just simply isn't enough BTC out there for everybody to use in order to maintain those elevated prices. It's the same reason why gold ended up being being replaced with the dollar is that once the United States or any industrialized nation, it doesn't matter which one it is, right? And this is really Cantillon's essay, you know, if you read through Cantillon, Cantillon's essay, the increase and decrease of money to the state really explains it. It's three chapters in there. Very, very, very good good read. But ultimately, the same thing. It's a, it's a fixed currency. If you do not have an elastic money supply, then what will end up happening, right? And I, whether it's a good or bad thing, it's the position that you have taken. I'm not trying to argue for one or the other. I just want to make that clear first. But what will end up happening is, is that if you have gold or BTC or anything else that does fix, there's only a certain amount of it out there. The most industrialized nation who is exporting all their products will then import all the either the gold or the, the BTC. And if they do not send that back out there to the world, whether they purchase stuff or invest back out there to the world or do something to get it back out there, right, then it's going to get hoarded. And that will then deprive the rest of the economy from being able to do transactions. This is what happened with the gold, right? The United States was a manufacturing powerhouse. We built the world's greatest stuff. We sent that out there to the world. The world sent us their gold. They were deprived of gold to do transactions with. We said, hey, no problem. Check it out. We got dollars. Look at dollars are way better for, for liquidity purposes. You can do all the transactions you want. In fact, all the transactions you want because we can provide all the liquidity that you need to do it. Here's the problem. You're not going to be able to trade those dollars back over for gold. Now, that is what really started creating the issues that, that we're now facing today. So how is it that you are going to redistribute the wealth back out there without falling into complete poverty? You can't right? There's just no way of doing it. So the United States was to face one of two outcomes. Either one, you keep the system going by creating fiat currency and providing the world with the liquidity they need, or you suffer in misery and poverty for a while until you can figure out to lower your standard of living, become a producer and saver again, and then start producing products that you can distribute out there to the world to get the money back. But this is ultimately going to happen to no matter what economy that you have if you have a fixed amount of currency within it even like mining new currency like going out and getting new gold out of the out of the ground or something you're only limited to how much production that you can get out of out of the ground right same thing with btc it's a limited amount of of coins that will ever be produced and you can only get so much out of the program so having a limited currency supply which is fine like i mean i'm i'm prepared to deal with that but most people are not Right. And having the boom and bust cycles that would come from the industrialized people being able to hoard the money and then having to redistribute it back out again. These are very devastating effects that end up hitting the economy and especially to people who are not prepared or at the end of their towards the end of their working career of life in general, they don't have time to deal with another cycle of downturns. Right. They're hoping to maintain their retirements, their portfolios, their incomes or whatever it is. And in order to do that, you have to have this fiat currency with an elastic money supply that can go on for generations in that fashion. Like whether it's a good or bad thing, that's up to you. But you know, why can't we use BTC? Because of that reason, there's a limited amount and it would limit the amount of transactions and the most industrialized nations would hoard it. All righty guys, that was so much fun hanging out with you. I appreciate everybody joining in on today's live stream. We got 208 people watching with 100 likes. Thank you so much for hitting that like button. Um, left links down in the description if you are interested in purchasing the Cantillon essay. Looks just like this. Great book. I encourage everybody to go read this. It's an essay that was written hundreds of years ago. And of course, it's kind of primitive in the idea that they were using horses and wagons and stuff like that. And we have cell phones and airplanes today. 
But the information, the economic forces that were written down hundreds of years ago by Cantillon are still at play today. And if you can recognize them, you'll see that a lot more has to do with economic forces as natural as gravity than they do with like polit political forces that are more just, you know, entertainment purposes as my in my opinion goes but um, anyway there's a link down in the description for it from Amazon uh, it's an associate affiliate link so I get a little commission off of the sale of it but you don't need to purchase the book the book is the essay is completely free at the Mises Institute so if you just type in Cantillon essay on economic theory you will find the the free link to it um, but if you do happen to click on the Amazon affiliate link anything you put in your cart for the next 24 hours I will also get a little bit of commission for so yeah if you're just looking to make an Amazon purchase, no matter what it is, just go and click on that affiliate link and then go do your regular shopping like you normally do. And yeah, I'll get a little, little piece of that. So thank you so much, everybody, for joining the channel, joining this live stream, doing everything that you do to support the uneducated economist. You guys let me know.